uh, Dr. Vajovic up. Robert, I get an honor of introducing our first um, key keynote speaker. Uh, would you please uh, pull up my introductory slides? Thank you. Just a little bit about the uh, um, Knights Templar Eye Foundation. I think just looking through, uh, throughout the room, um, many of us um, definitely um, are very grateful for the support they have provided, but also um, owe the, the kind of instrumental grant support that's needed for starting off their career. I know I'm very thankful for having my start uh, with their um, grant. As you may know, their mission is to improve vision through research, education, and supporting access to care. And since their inception in 1956, they definitely have spent tremendous efforts, um, uh, monetary efforts, in supporting research patient care and granting over $24 um, million in um, support uh, for um, basic science. Now, we are very thankful that um, they were instrumental in helping us start our kickoff, our first meeting, and now our second meeting in supporting our, uh, our keynote lectures. I'm honored to introduce our first uh, keynote lecturer, Arlene Drake. She's an undergrad degree in um, biology and physiology uh, from University of Scranton. Uh, she did her international research fellowship at the University of also in Norway and medical school at Penn Pennsylvania State University. Her internship and research was done in um, Georgetown University, and she did not one, but two, but three fellowships uh, in ophthalmic genetics at Wilmer, in pediatric ophthalmology and strabism at the University of Iowa, and molecular ophthalmology with uh, Ed Stone at the University of Iowa. Her academics is um, very impressive, starting at fa the faculty member at um, Emory, leading the, their, their, the way for a fellowship as well as the children's um, clinic. She then became a chair of pediatric ophthalmology department, Children's um, Hospital in Denver, and then returned to the University of Iowa to become the uh, Ronald Keck Professor in Pediatric Ophthalmology and Gen X Research. She, uh, she starts her service there as well. She's a co-investigator in a phase three RP65 gene therapy clinical trial, which we all know has led to the first FDA-approved ocular gene therapy um, drug. She's the current investigator in ongoing clinical trial for CP290LCA, and she focuses her efforts in really coming up with mouse models to study the human retinal degeneration as well as the electrophysiology of the human foveal hypoplasia. She um, has written over 80 peer-reviewed publications and 21 book chapters. She's a genetic section editor for the upcoming third edition of the textbook for pediatric retina. She's the inaugural chair of the APOS Genetics Eye Disease Task Force, now a standing committee, and reviews m for multiple professional journals. I'm very much honored to say that she's the first woman to become the tenured a full professor in the University of Iowa Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science. And without further ado, I would like for all of us to welcome our first keynote, their Arlene Drecker, and talk about congenital nystagmus and pediatric retinal disorders in molecular genetics era. Thank you, Arlene, for joining us. Thank you so much for that great introduction. I do hope that Cindy is okay. I'm going to show this from my computer because I have a lot of videos, which I hope work. <laughs> we'll always see. Um, and I will try to uh, keep on time. This. Uh, is my grant support. I guess I can look up there. I don't have any personal financial interest in anything, but I have a lot of um, research grant support from both industry and from foundations and the NIH, and so um, I'm grateful for all that support. I want to also really thank the Knights Templar. I, too, had a Knights Templar grant when I was first starting out, and they've done just beautiful work in ophthalmology and eye disease. And I want to thank the organizing committee and especially Emmy with whom I'm working on her textbook as well as uh, this, this course. So it's wonderful. I've never been to Salt Lake before. Uh, so this is just a wonderful meeting to attend. So I'm coming to you from Iowa. And we say in Iowa we have the seasons a little different. It's almost winter, winter, still winter, and then tornado season. So right now we're in tornado season. Last week, I got to spend an hour in a downtown tornado shelter with my 16-year-old daughter because we were shopping, and the, a tornado hit, actually, just at uh, the edge of Iowa City. But that was really fun because 16-year-olds don't talk to you much. So when you're in a tornado shelter, they kind of give it all away. They think they might be blown away pretty soon, so that was, that was good. <laughs> 
And you know, this is a postcard you can actually buy in Iowa. It's not made in Wisconsin or something. It's the shape of Iowa, and it says, Iowa, it may be a black hole you'll never escape, but it's a great black hole to raise kids in. <laughs> and that's very true. And I like to add and to do genetics in, because we can't go outside much of the year, so we, we stay in and we think about medicine and research and things like that. So I'm really, really fortunate to have actually a translational research lab and to be a clinician scientist. And all the, all the images here are of my patients. Uh, this is a, let's see, oh, I don't know if this is working. Oh, here, one of my human patients, uh, and then my, my porcine patient and my murine patient. Um, I'm doing a project with the University of South Dakota because if it wasn't nice enough in Iowa, I want to go to South Dakota too to do uh, pig ERGs for some of their work and we have a lot of mice work and then of course we have the patients. So it's basically the best job I can imagine. So the title is Congenital Nystagmus and Pediatric Retinal Disorders in the Molecular Era and that implies that we should be doing something different uh, in our thinking with these disorders in the molecular era. And I, I think that's true. And maybe we can have some discussion because not everyone agrees with me, but, but we'll see if I can convince you. And a lot of people say that we're having, we've had a genetic revolution, but I like to say we are in the middle of a genetic revolution and we are all the revolutionaries. And so sometimes we're gonna have misfires and sometimes we're not gonna know exactly what we're doing, but we will get to the end where the genetic revolution has actually occurred. So I wanna talk about in this molecular genetics era, what tests should we do, which patients should we test, and then what should we do with this information? So I think what we should test, we just had a beautiful morning of talks on what we should test. It's just a perfect segue. So I'm not going to say very much about that. Um, and which patients we should test. I think uh, Dr. Sisk, you know, made a really good case for the kinds of things that make us think that this patient must have a, a retinal genetic disorder. And absolutely those patients should be worked up and investigated very carefully. But the patients I want to talk about are the ones who maybe we are not thinking of and we should. So these groups are patients with congenital nystagmus who appear to have normal vision and normal retinas. Patients who have early onset myopia, so I mean before school age, because typical juvenile myopia starts maybe seven, eight, nine years old. And patients who have albinism. So let's talk with the congenital nystagmus patients. So what I was taught was that if a child comes in with nystagmus and they're blind, you should think that child probably has LCA and work it up, either with an ERG or in, in the more current times with um, genetic testing. And if a child comes in with congenital nystagmus and they can see normally for their age, that's probably motor nystagmus and they're probably going to have pretty good vision and you, know, you don't have to worry about it too much. You can get a brain MRI if you want to make sure there's nothing neurologic, but otherwise don't worry about it. And I was taught that vertical congenital nystagmus is the kind we're more often going to find with neurologic conditions, so definitely get that brain MRI. But if it's normal, again, reassure parents, and probably the vision will be good. And that there's a shimmering asymmetric nystagmus called spasmus nutans that is a self-limited kind of immaturity of the neurologic system that will go away on its own. It can be caused by diencephalic tumors, so we were taught to do an MRI in babies. But if the MRI is normal, again, advise people it's probably going to go away and, and it's probably benign. So now I want to show you some of the nystagmus patients uh, that I have seen recently. And, you know, if, if you look at the kind of nystagmus these patients have, which one has a diagnostic ERG? We've just seen the beautiful example of the diagnostic ERG from um, the previous talk. And which patient here has a treatable condition? Because one of them has a treatable condition. So if we don't work them up, we don't know which ones. And there's a whole variety here. So this kid has vertical nystagmus, and so does this kid. So are they neurologic? This person has kind of a pendular, just constant, very small amplitude back and forth nystagmus. This baby has really good fix and follow and just has intermittent nystagmus, if you watch, kind of at the end gazes of, of their versions. And this kid has a very shimmering nystagmus. So think about those for a minute. I will tell you in a minute which, which, who has what. But the thing that really made me start thinking about congenital nystagmus was a child who was referred to me when he was seven years old. And he had had spasmus nutans diagnosed when he was six months old. And a brain MRI was done, it was normal. He saw a really good neuro-ophthalmologist and they said, you know, this is spasmus nutans, it will, it will go away and vision will be normal. 
But his vision never seemed quite normal, and it never went away. So they saw three more doctors, all excellent pediatric ophthalmologists or neuro-ophthalmologists, and every one of them said, this looks like spasmus nutans, we should do an MRI. They did another MRI, it was normal, and then they said, it's going to get better, and, and don't worry about it. He had normal growth and development, everything fine, but finally when he was seven, they ended up in my clinic because the teachers of this kid said, I don't care what anybody has told you. He cannot see. He can't see what we're doing on the board. There's something wrong with this child. So I saw him. He did have this shimmering spasmus nutans like nystagmus. Um, but in my mind, this is congenital nystagmus because it hasn't gone away. And so I usually do an ERG. And so I did an ERG in this child. And he has the, the classic diagnostic ERG that Dr. Lamb just told us about, where this is the patient on your left and this is a normal on the right. The rod response in dim light after dark adaptation is barely recordable. And then when you do a bright flash in dark adaptation, he has this downgoing A wave, which is a pretty normal amplitude, but the B wave is tiny. So the B wave is the bipolar cells. We just don't have a bipolar cell response. The oscillatory potentials, which are inner retina, are what I like to call biphasic instead of spiking. And then his cones are essentially non-recordable. So this is really classic for the congenital stationary night blindness group of, of ERGs. And when you have cone affected also, it is called um, incomplete congenital stationary night blindness. So we did genetic testing for genetic or congenital stationary night blindness panel. And he has mutation in CACNA1F, which is one of the genes in this group. Now, CACNA1F is very interesting, and we've started to call it a synapse dysfunction. It's classed with congenital stationary night blindness because it has the same ERG, and some patients have night blindness. Other patients get a cone dystrophy. This is what we were talking about before the meeting started, about the different manifestations of the mutations in the same gene. So this kid has more of the cone dystrophy type of CACNA1F, synapse disorder. And his parents felt so bad because they had been saying for his whole life, watch where you're going. Why are you tripping over things? They had been telling his teachers, oh no, he can see fine. And now they find out he has an actual retinal problem. So if this had been diagnosed early, he has 20-60 vision. He's not horribly impaired. But everybody could have been doing the right things for him instead of kind of the wrong things. So this precipitated a study that um, a medical student, Morgan Birch, did one summer where she looked at charts of 202 consecutive infantile nystagmus patients that had been sent to the pediatric clinic or my genetics clinic, because I have general peds clinics as well. And a lot of pediatrics, pediatric ophthalmologists see nystagmus patients every day. And when we looked at the patients who had had full workups, the most common cause was albinism. And next was labor congenital amaurosis of various different genetic types. After that was non-LCA retinal dystrophies. And in fourth place was motor nystagmus. But there are reports in the literature that say motor nystagmus is the number one cause of congenital nystagmus. But if you read them, they didn't do ERGs. <laughs> they did an MRI like we were all taught, and it was normal. So they said, okay, that's motor nystagmus. So if you look at what test the patients had first, the blue bar is how many patients had that test first, and this is the number of patients up the side. And the orange bar is how many of those showed something that was actually related to their diagnosis. So the number one most common test first was an MRI, and it had the lowest yield of any test. Almost any other test eye test you could do, like OCT or ERG, or genetic test or a specific eye genetic test, all had a better yield. And then if you divided the patients into those who had another neurologic sign, sorry, be, besides nystagmus. So these patients had some other neuro, neurologic sign. Their head circumference was too small or too big. They had some developmental delays. They, you know, something, their optic nerves didn't look quite right. If they had some neurologic finding, those were the only ones who had anything positive on MRI. The ones who had no other neurologic finding in this group, there wasn't a single one that MRI was diagnostic. And if you look about the costs of these different things, at least at the University of Iowa, the most expensive test is MRI and it has the lowest yield. So I would propose that we start thinking differently about congenital nystagmus, not immediately go to MRI, but think that a lot of these patients are going to have an eye reason try to do that workup first if there are no neurologic findings. 
So let's look at these patients again. So here's a kid, he has this vertical kind of upbeat nystagmus, and you can see his optic nerve pictures there. He has very small optic nerves. So this child has optic nerve hypoplasia, he had an MRI, he has a small pituitary, and is being followed for endocrine disorders. This child has intermittent nystagmus, and good fix and follow, and she has that totally flat electroretinogram you have there, and we did genetic testing, and she has RPE 65 LCA. So even though she has great vision at this age, her chance of being LP by the time she's 30 is pretty high, and we actually have a treatment for this. But many people would have said, this is nystagmus blockage, she has esotropia along with the the uh, nystagmus, she has good fix and follow. Here's another kid with upbeat nystagmus, what I was taught, this is gonna be neurologic, it's CACNA 1F. It's again, that congenital stationary night blindness category with this CACNA 1F gene. This kid with the shimmering nystagmus has labor congenital amaurosis, which was eventually figured out to be CRB1 related. And this woman has FRMD7 nystagmus. This is an X-linked nystagmus that I think about as a motor nystagmus. She has 20-25 vision. There's many manifesting female carriers, if you will. Um, and some patients have a little subtle difference on their um, OCT, but this woman has a completely normal fovea, completely normal ERG, everything normal. So don't judge a book by its cover or an eye by its wiggle. But what does it matter? Well, it matters because of what we've already seen this morning. I was so fortunate to be an investigator in the uh, phase three RPE65 Luxterna therapy trial. On your left, you see one of our patients prior to treatment who's trying to do this obstacle course completely with her feet. She has no vision you know, whatsoever in, in dim light. And one year, actually 30 days later, one year later, two years later, three years later, we're now up to four years later, you can see that she can easily navigate an obstacle course. You know, she, she really has had an incredible improvement. So we don't want to miss these patients. And the FDA has approved this for down to one year of age. I was talking to one of the PEDS retinal surgeons yesterday where Steve Russell, who did these surgeries at our institution, said there's no way he's doing a one-year-old. <laughs> because the eye is just too different, but a three-year-old, okay? So, I mean, they can have it early. So we made this uh, algorithm, which you don't even have to look at really, but just to know that it, it reflexes back and forth, you know? It keeps making you think, well, if the ERG was normal, should you do an MRI? If, the, if there's no TIDs, what does that mean? And Brittany Scruggs did a new version of this, which is much better, and it's gonna be in Dr. Hartnett's Pediatric Retina E3 book. So you can look forward to that, just to help you think about, have I really exhausted all the possibilities in this patient? And so, you know, I've learned that in, in a child with congenital nystagmus who's blind, I just go right to genetic testing because, yep, that probably is LCA. If the child has normal vision, though, and no neurologic signs, I do an ERG and an OCT. If they do have neurologic signs, I do the MRI. But the most important thing is that if the brain MRI is normal in one of these congenital nystagmus kids, don't stop there. Go back and do all the eye things because many of them have a retinal reason for their nystagmus. So that brings me to um, albinism. You know, you might not think of albinism too much when you think about pediatric retinal disorders, but albinism is a pediatric retinal disorder, and it's really affecting the most important part of the retina, the macula. So AMD, we think, is this very big problem because it affects the macula, but albinism, we don't think of it much as a retina problem, even though these poor people don't have a fovea. So we looked, when I saw that it was the number one cause of congenital nystagmus in my practice, we looked at 209 charts of, uh, we pulled them based on features of albinism. So they had iris translumination, nystagmus, foveal hypoplasia, or someone had said they had albinism. And 58 of these had actually had genetic testing, and you can see the breakdown of the different types of albinism. OCA1 is tyrosinase, it's definitely the most common. OCA2 is a close second. OA1 is the X-linked albinism. Um, and then OA4, we had several, and then we had two patients with hermansky pudlak which was not suspected, okay? So it's not like these patients were bleeding or anything. They just happened to have it when we did the testing. And 20% of patients had no mutations found at all. So we did this scoring system, and a higher score meant more features of albinism.
And when we looked at the patients who had two mutations versus one mutation versus zero mutation, their albinism score kind of stair-stepped. So two mutations that are known to cause albinism gives more full-blown albinism. Patients who have one mutation, a lot of them, they have a milder albinism score. And then the patients with zero mutations had a, a low albinism score, although you, you did give them some points, but a lot of these patients turned out not to have albinism. And I'll mention briefly some of the other things they had, but there's a lot of other things that cause iris translumination defects that get misdiagnosed. The higher the albinism score, the more likely two mutations, the worse their visual acuity, and also an abnormal appearance to the optic nerve was correlated with worse visual acuity. So which of these two kids do you think has albinism? Yeah, so everybody's going to say, you know, it's this guy. But I'm going to tell you, it's him. So he has ocular albinism. And so you cannot judge. So we, I live in Iowa. There's tons of blonde kids. Every blonde kid with nystagmus gets sent in as albinism. And none of the kids with brown hair get sent in as albinism. You can't look and tell which one it is. And so if the whole family is blonde, it doesn't really matter that that blonde kid has albinism. You still have to do the whole workup. Now, if you can tell, let's say they have massive iris translumination defects, they have no pigment at all, does it really matter what type of albinism they have? Well, again, I would say it does because of Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome. And again, I was taught what it says down here in black. Even textbooks you can find say this. These patients have moderate pigment, so they're not completely hypopigmented. They have bleeding gums, very easy bruising. It's very rare, and it's mostly only in Puerto Ricans. And in our series of 58 patients, two have molecularly confirmed albinism, and neither one of them has any roots in Puerto Rico. And one of them you see here, her whole sclera transilluminates. She has no, no pigment whatsoever. And there are some types of Hermansky-Pudlak that are fairly benign, but there are others that are really life-threatening. So there's a couple of ways that you can tell if an albinism patient has Hermansky-Pudlak. One is by doing these platelet aggregation studies. The PTPTT is normal. That is not a diagnostic test at all. But you, you can do genetic testing, or you can do platelet EM, or you can do platelet aggregation studies. And the platelet EM, they say, you know, we should have chocolate chip cookies. You should see these dense granules in platelets on electromagnetic, um, or yeah, EM. <laughs> and they're butter cookies in HPS patients. They do not have those dense granules, which is why they don't um, clot properly. So once I figured out, oh my gosh, I've been missing HPS patients my whole life, I started um, getting involved with the Hermansky-Pudlak Syndrome Foundation, and they sent these pictures, and these people asked that we show these pictures, because all these people have Hermansky-Pudlak Syndrome. And you cannot tell by looking at them. You wouldn't think they had albinism to begin with. And importantly, these two women are both from Puerto Rico. There is a founder effect, actually two founder effects in Puerto Rico. So if someone has Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome from Puerto Rico, they're more likely to have those mutations. Also, it is more common in Puerto Rico than in the rest of the world, but it occurs in every ethnicity, every population. You can't tell by looking. So these people have foveal hypoplasia and nystagmus, and if you see anybody who looks in any way and you think they have albinism, they should have that genetic testing. I got really interested when I saw this article in our local newspaper because they were raising money for this guy to go to Mayo Clinic and get a lung transplant. And he worked at our local grocery store. His whole history is here. He went to City, or City High School in our town, Iowa City. He played football at City High School. He was a good player. And I thought, that guy looks like he has albinism. And you read all the way down here, he does have albinism. He was 40 years old when he went into acute respiratory distress and almost died. People misdiagnosed it all over the place. Nobody thought it could be related to his albinism. He has Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome. And he did get a lung transplant. And I, again, I think of this guy every time I see a kid with albinism because he's not from Puerto Rico. He doesn't have moderate pigment. He has a deadly disease that could have been treated way better if he had been diagnosed earlier. So I'm going to ask you, at the end I have some other um, interactive patients, but this fundus, I know I'm showing it in the albinism section, but what do you think about this fundus? This child was sent to me with a diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. She's seven years old. 
Her best corrective visual acuity has only been ever 2060. She has no nystagmus, but she has this very strange pigmentation. And when I saw her, I, I scheduled her for an ERG because she was being sent in as a RP, but I also did a slit lamp exam. And luckily, I put the, the light through the center and looked for TIDs because there they are. You would not know it looking at her. And she has no fovea whatsoever. And her ERG was, of course, normal. Uh, and we found one mutation in OCA. It was a real mutation, but she was one of those people who had only one mutation. And she doesn't have any nystagmus, and her parents were just convinced she must really have RP. And so she got ERGs every year because they couldn't shake this idea that she was going to go blind. Finally, uh, we did whole genome sequencing and found that she has a deletion on the other allele. So we could finally tell the parents we found that second allele. So it doesn't always look like we think it will look. Here's a few other phenocopies just quickly. Um, this is a five-year-old boy who was referred from ENT. He had a cochlear implant from very young because he was deaf. And he has fine nystagmus and poor vision, so they thought, well, he must have Usher syndrome. But I did an ERG, and it was totally normal, so I thought, well, that's not Usher syndrome. And then I looked at him really closely. He has TIDs, iris TIDs, and he has like a hypopigmented area of his iris. It's a little bluish in addition to his foveal hypoplasia. Does anybody know what this is? So this is Wardenburg syndrome. And there is nothing in the literature that says that patients with Wardenburg syndrome have foveal hypoplasia and nystagmus, but that MITF gene is in the same pigment cascade as albinism, and Brian Brooks now at the NIH has uh, a couple of patients with the same thing, and maybe someday we'll write them up. <laughs> but, you know, this guy looked like he had albinism. All his albinism testing was negative, and then, you know, I figured out the Wardenburg angle. Here's another kid who was sent for Usher syndrome, okay? He has cochlear implants. He was deaf since birth. He does not see very well. He has nystagmus. I don't know how well it shows up here, but he has iris translumination defects all around the periphery. He has no pigment in his retina whatsoever, no pigment. His ERG is very normal, a little bit low amplitude, but that could be because he's a minus 25 myope, minus 25. And you can see how uh, sort of excavated this is. So we went through a whole bunch of stuff with him, but to make a long story short, he has this thing called Donny Barrow syndrome. And in Donny Barrow syndrome, surprisingly, they spill retinol binding protein into their urine. So they've got this weird metabolism thing However, the ERG is really normal. Even though he's a minus 25, the ERG was almost normal. But he does not have albinism. He has this other completely different thing. And he's a minus 25, and he spontaneously detached one retina, and our people put it back on, and he was plano without any lens. And his mother said, oh, can't you do that in the other eye? <laughs> of course, everybody was like, no. And then he actually did detach his other eye, and now he's plano in both eyes. And he has 2150 vision, which is pretty amazing amazing after all that we know about him. Here's another kid. He has had severe lifelong photophobia. He's, his best corrected vision has always been 2060. He has fine horizontal nystagmus, and he has these iris TIDs all around the periphery. So I thought he was going to have albinism, but he's got quite a bit of pigment in his fundi. And then we did OCT, and it's, you can kind of call it foveal hypoplasia because it's not completely extruding the inner layers, uh, but it's not typical. He has a pretty small foveal avascular zone. He has a pretty normal dark adapted ERG, but his light adapted ERG is non-recordable. So this guy has a, a cone problem, as we heard about earlier today, and I know no one will ever guess what this is, because the diagnostic test for him was a chest x-ray. So this is his chest, and this is a normal chest, and he has this unbelievably small thoracic cavity. And this is June syndrome, or asphyxiating thoracic dysplasia, but he's not asphyxiating. He's now like 
14 or 15 years old, he plays baseball, and there's nothing in the literature that shows us what the fovea looks like in June syndrome. So this was a puzzle for a very long time. So the take home messages I think about albinism are, it's very common. So we found it was 19% of all the congenital nystagmus in our study, but only if we tested them. The patients may appear normally pigmented, they still have an increased risk of skin cancer, even if they look normal, so you want to tell them that. 25% in our series did not have nystagmus, so you can't go by the nystagmus. And about 4% have hermansky pudlak syndrome, and, and it could be life-saving to diagnose that. So all that trends illuminates is not albinism, but a lot of it is. And all of these patients, I think, deserve a workup, including genetic testing. So we will just segue quickly into early onset myopia. So I think most retina specialists do think about high myopia as a retinal disorder, but they don't necessarily think about it as a genetic disorder or a genetically testable disorder. So here's a girl who came in to me. She was referred by a pediatric ophthalmologist when she was five for intermittent next T, but she had a very high myopia. And she had no nystagmus. I asked about night blindness, other complaints, nothing. And then the mother brought her little sister in. Her sister, same thing. She was like a minus 10, both eyes. So two sisters, very good acuity, very high myopia. What's the differential? This is what her fundus looks like. Basically just myopic changes, but pretty impressive for a six-year-old or whatever she was at that time. Same thing with her OCT. I mean, maybe the fovea isn't quite normal. There's some staphyloma there. So, you know, there's a, a differential for pathologic myopia in childhood, and it includes a lot of systemic syndromes as well as ocular syndromes. And I basically sent her to medical genetics, and we tested for all of these different things, and they didn't have any of the typical things like Stickler syndrome. And at nine years of age, she was even more myopic. She was minus 13. She was still 2030 and 2025, no nystagmus. But her mother said, you know, when we're in the dark, I don't think she sees as well as we do. So then I was thinking, well, could it be congenital stationary night blindness or RP? We did visual fields, and they were normal, but her, her 1 to E isopter is a bit small. But other than that, normal, not like an RP field for sure. And then here's her ERG. So again, we have a diagnostic ERG for congenital stationary night blindness because she has no rod function, an electronegative standard combined response, a biphasic oscillatory potentials. She has a slightly low single flash cone and very mildly low 30 hertz flicker. So because her cones are normal, this puts her in the um, other category and, and we can look at the genes because it's combined into the incomplete and the complete. And so she's now in the complete category. And there's a whole bunch of genes that you can test, and we sent testing, and she has two mutations in TRPM1, and so does her sister, and each parent carries one. So, so this is a very classic, and as we talked about before, diagnostic ERG. Well, then I started ERGing all the kids who were high myopes before the age of seven. And we found seven patients with TRPM1 mutations who have exactly the same ERG, only three of the seven ever had nystagmus. And of those, only one had it at the time we ascertained them. And only four of the seven, even though I've followed these kids now for like 12 years, only four of them ever actually noticed night blindness. And I think that's because we did an FST, and the FST, you fully dark adapt someone, and then you see how dim a light they can see. And their FST is about 50% of normal. So if they're in a very dark situation, they're not going to be able to see as well as a normal person. But if they're in a city with normal lighting and stuff, they really may not notice much of a problem. And so we published this, and it very kindly got a, uh, a commentary with it. And I was really happy that Rob Kunikupu, they asked to write this commentary, got exactly what I was saying, which was kids who are high myopes may have congenital stationary night blindness, or some other retinal problem, and they may not have the things we were taught to look for. They may not have nystagmus or night blindness and still have congenital stationary night blindness. And one important thing about this is we may someday have a gene therapy treatment for this, but in addition, all the kids now are being put on atropine for myopia, which is great, and I really hope that we will see a slowing of myopia. But that is for school-age myopia. It's been tested for school-age myopia. I saw a kid the other day, 
five years old, minus 10. He's been on atropine for a year. Of course, now he's minus 13 because I did an ERG. He has TRPM1, congenital stationary night blindness. Atropine is not going to help him. And the other interesting thing that we found, well, first, uh, there is a differential for the electronegative ERG. It's not all CSNB. The most important things are batten disease, uh, juvenile X-linked retinoschisis, though it often is not electronegative in kids, but batten disease is. That's the scary one that we have to think about. Um, and cancer-associated retinopathy. So you have to think about it. It's not always CSNB. If it is, you can categorize the genes, as you see here. But we also have to think about these kids who come in with high myopia. And the ones who have axial high myopia, I think we really need to think about doing a genetic or some other workup and, and this is from Ginny Utz, who's on the APOS Genetics Committee with me, um, and this will be on the APOS website. We have to think about working up these kids because otherwise the parents are very concerned. Why are they getting more nearsighted? And what we found in these kids, uh, the TRPM1 kids was, when we saw them at like three, they were like minus 10, they progressed rapidly up till about age seven or eight, and then they plateau which is the exact opposite of the juvenile myopia kids who have onset between like 7 and 12, and then they progress, and then they plateau like in their 20s. So it's a different type of myopia. So in the last few minutes before we do some questions and some interactive cases, I wanted to just talk about something that we rarely talk about. So what do we do with these diagnoses once we find them? We, we show many slides and we say, okay, I found, oh, and this kid had batten and this kid had RP, but what do we do it? So when we tell parents about this, it's not easy because we're giving them bad news. And we wanna do non-directive counseling, which is the, the way in genetics, you wanna tell them what's available, not push them to one thing or the other. Some people may wanna use the information for family planning, for treatment, or for clinical trials. But if the patient is very mildly affected, do we want to just let them go see there's a clinical trial? They have 2030 vision, there's a clinical trial for Stargardt. Should they go into that trial? Do we know enough about it? Do they know enough about it? And should we just send them to clinicaltrials.gov? I give that website to my parents of kids, but I'm gonna show you some issues with it. So, so one thing that's important is for a long time we've been t telling people that if they know the gene that's affected in their family before they get pregnant, they can do pre-implantation genetic testing with IVF to avoid having a, an affected pregnancy. And I have had several patients do this, but it's not widely done. And so I think this article is really, really good. It's very recent, it's from Israel. And they use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to prevent kids with heritable eye disease. So it's specifically about heritable eye diseases, and it's in ophthalmic genetics. And there were 35 mothers they went through 88 cycles of IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, and it resulted in 18 unaffected children being born. And they list the disorders here. There were, there were albinism, 10 families, retinized pigmentosa, 7, retinoblastoma, 4, blue cone monochromacy, achromatopsia, aniridia, Hermansky-Pudlak syndrome, LCA, Nori disease. So they, they had the whole range. So obviously it's not 100%, but I think if families are considering this, this paper is a really good resource to tell them it can be done and it is being done. Then of course we have to tell them about clinical trials. So first we have to tell them about the one FDA approved treatment, but then we have to tell them there's all these clinical trials. And I often have them go to clinicaltrials.gov. But you know, there's this disclaimer that says that on clinicaltrials.gov, these studies that are posted are not vetted. And that's really important. Clinicaltrials.gov is such a great resource, and I look at it for patients before each of their visits so I know what's out there, but it's not vetted. And so there was this really nice article from Baskin Palmer about patients who had vision loss after intravitreal injection of autologous stem cells. So there's a loophole in the law that if you're putting someone's own cells back into them, you can get by without all of the many regulations that we all have to do for clinical trials. And so there are clinical trials going on where they're, they're just trying it, just putting people's stem cells into their vitreous, into the retrobulbar space, et cetera. And there were three people who went totally blind from this, as you can imagine. And it was very courageous for the authors to report this. And just recently, I had a family come in with a 16-year-old boy who has um, dominant optic atrophy plus. And his dominant optic atrophy is horrible. He's got massive central scotomas. He's got like 21,000 vision because he just has a little rim. And it's genetically proven uh, OPA1 mutations. 
And he had found this, um, this study online, because he has voice to text on his computer and he's super smart, and it says they treat optic atrophy, and this is one of the autologous stem cell injections, and they will do subtenon intravitreal retrobulbar injection of this kid's stem cells, and he was so mad that his parents wouldn't take him for this because he wants to get a driver's license. And he was convinced, this is a, on clinicaltrials.gov, he's convinced he'll be able to get his driver's license if he gets this treatment. So I tell patients, here's the site, go to it, but you know, if there's something you're interested in, let's talk about it. And I think that's a good thing for everyone to do so we can look at it and say, does this look like a, a really good thing for this patient? So then finally, what if the news of the diagnosis is bad? And in peds retina, there are a lot of bad diagnoses. And I started to wonder, what is the best way to tell parents about this? Because I think my whole career, I've mainly kind of emulated the people I trained with uh, who were very good, but, but there must be a way. And there is actually a literature out there about how to deliver bad news. And I think about our bad news in kind of grades of bad news. You know, like when we walk into a room and a kid has come in 2200 and they need glasses, we think that's good news, but often the parents are just devastated and the mother is crying and stuff. So we, we have to remember that for each parent and patient, we have to kind of get to the level that they are. But sometimes it's really devastating news, like it's, it's a fatal condition. And there have been studies that show that doctors really fear giving bad news. We fear being blamed, or we fear that the person's going to get emotional, we won't know what to do, we'll take away their hope. And so there has been a study or two about how to do it the right way. So the first thing they say is, you know, let the patient or family or kid express their feelings and don't minimize it. Don't say, oh, well, you know, at least he only needs glasses. He's not going blind like the kid next door. And also don't say, well, at least he's only going blind. At least he's not going to die like the kid next door. You know, doctors have actually said things like that to patients, believe it or not. So we, we want to not minimize any of their concerns and just hear what they're worried about. Because a lot of times it's a specific thing. Oh, he'll never be able to play football. And you might be able to say, yeah, you know, if he, he can wear sports goggles, he can play football. And then that's really their main worry. They also recommend talking to people ahead of time about the Walmart effect. And this has become a thing that's published, which means you're wheeling your kid through Walmart and he looks weird or his one eye is gone or he's got a patch on. And just random people come up and say, what's wrong with your kid? Why does your kid look weird? And this has become so common that they actually recommend telling parents. People may come up to you unsolicited and ask you or your child what's wrong with their eye. And I always tell them, these are rude questions. You can just ignore the person and walk away, or you can say anything you want. You know, I was attacked by a bear. I was, and sometimes with kids, this is really helpful. Um, and they've actually shown that, especially with kids, if you give them something to say ahead of time, they feel much better after the encounters happen. So kids with white canes, I, I say, how are you doing? Is anybody making fun of you? And they'll say, yeah, I hate using this white cane. People make fun of me. They say stuff. And I said, well, why don't you say, it's a lightsaber. I don't want to lift it, so I, I don't want to blind you or something like that. You know, make it something funny. And, and that has really worked with a lot of kids. Or teach them how to say the whole name of their disorder. That will also shut up other kids really quickly. <laughs> there are also ways that they have found are better to deliver devastating news. And so, so how many people think that the best way is for the physician to remain calm and controlled, the parents are upset and obviously distressed, versus the physician also becoming emotional and distressed? Who thinks it's better for the physician to remain calm and controlled? A lot of people, and, and I th that is what I was taught, okay? Well, actually, there's a body of literature that shows that if the physician shows emotion, it is much, much easier for the patient and better for the patient. And there was a study, which I would not have wanted to do, called the Death of a Child Study, where they actually went and interviewed parents after they had had a child die, 
and they asked them about the ways and the people who had told them about the death. And police officers got much higher rating than doctors and nurses because the parents said the doctor was just like, well, I'm sorry, but we lost him, you know? And the police officer was like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to tell you this. You know, your son is gone. So that was really an eye opener for me. The other really helpful thing is they've done studies that show, okay, I gotta wrap this part up so we can have questions. <laughs> but that, that they've done studies that show that if you prepare someone for bad news, even if it's a second before, it actually helps. It helps them absorb what you say. So if you walk in and say, yep, it's retinitis pigmentosa, yep, it's batten disease like we, well, like we thought, then they just, it, it's just a shock reaction. Where if you walk in and say, we have some really difficult news about the testing. I'm so sorry you have to go through this. It is batten disease. That seems like a small difference, but apparently it really helps people to, to kind of process what you're saying. And so there's this spikes uh, kind of memorization thing that reminds you of what to do that's from the oncology literature, not surprisingly, because they have to do this all the time. And you can look this up, it's in a paper, and it's, it's actually a really good paper. And they also mention, you know, also talk about, we're gonna help you with school stuff. They might be eligible for Make-A-Wish. I was really afraid to bring up Make-A-Wish. But you know, parents sometimes just brighten right up at that because it gives them like something, oh, we can do this and it's gonna be a good thing. So I'll just share briefly a recent case with a seven-year-old kid who was referred for rapidly decreasing vision. He was totally normal, he had no seizures, he had nothing else. His mother thought maybe he was a little night blind even in childhood. And his ERG was very, very abnormal, but it was not electronegative. So I wasn't really thinking about Batten disease, but his mother is a nurse and she had a friend who had a child with Batten disease who started having vision problems at the same time. So she was really worried about this. So I sent a panel, a retinal degeneration panel that included Batten disease. And that's another caveat. Look at the panels you're sending because a lot of them include Batten disease now and you want to at least tell the parents there are some more serious things that are multi-system, not just retinal, that will be on this. I don't go into detail, but I, I tell them. So we scheduled a follow-up visit. That's the other thing. So you don't want to like call somebody and tell them to come back in. If you have even the slightest suspicion that it's going to be something serious, it's good to just schedule another visit. So sure enough, it came back to mutations in CLN3. I, I was just floored. So we, we had them come in. We changed their time so it would be a quieter time of the day. I had my orthoptist bring some toys in that she could play with the kid. She just stayed there the whole time because, as you know, a lot of times the kid is coming around and talking to the parents and stuff and they can't pay attention. And I also called palliative care and they said if the parents wanted to talk to them, they would. And, and it was like an hour discussion. And, you know, I really, I didn't like sobbing cry, but I let myself express emotion because it was devastating and both parents were crying and, you know, I answered their questions and, you know, all of this stuff. And, and this was one of the cases where they didn't say like, so I didn't say, and they usually go completely blind. They didn't ask that. So I didn't say it. But what the father said was, you know, I really wanted him to play sports. I'm a soccer coach, you know, and, and I said, well, you know, he's, he's probably not going to have good enough vision for soccer you know, within a few years, but there's other things he can do, you know. So we went through it. But after this particular one that I had really prepared for, I really thought, does it matter? You know, I just gave these people the worst possible diagnosis in the world. I don't even think it matters how I said it. And then six months later, I got this note from the mother through my chart. And if you read it, you know, she says, you and your staff are so empathetic and we would not have asked for our situation to be handled any differently. First of all, I thought, what an incredible person that she could write this. I would never be able to write that after my child was given this diagnosis. But it was also so helpful to me because it told me, I mean, I've had other families who just it didn't appear to matter how I said anything. They were just so devastated. But I think for some people, it really does make a difference if we kind of prepare and, and use this information. So in summary, congenital nystagmus and pediatric retinal disorders deserve a full workup in the molecular genetic era because we have some treatments and clinical trials and family planning. I think that all kids with congenital nystagmus should have an ERG and should have 
MRI if they have any neurologic signs, or even if it just makes you feel better, but don't skip the ERG. I also think that all kids who have high myopia onset before school age should have an ERG considered because they may have something retinal going on there we don't know about. And I really think that all albinism patients should know that they are at risk for hermansky pudlak syndrome, that it can be picked up on a genetic test, and that, that you can also do platelet or other studies um, you know, to look at that. And albinism is way more common than we think, so suspect it more. Thank you for inviting me to your beautiful city. This is just a fabulous meeting. I'm looking forward to the rest of it. I want to thank all the parents and patients who come to me and who have participated in research. My colleagues, uh, Wanda Pfeiffer and Sajug Badurai, are just the best. And we have a ton of students also who work in the clinics and labs. And I want to leave with pictures of Iowa to show you it's not always horrible. There's like two days between winter and tornado season when we have a beautiful lake that we get out on and, you know, we have springtime and happiness and <laughs> all of that's good. So, and now we can have some questions. Anyone have a question? Yes. First, before we have questions, okay. we are considering that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that terrific educational presentation. And we, um, we wanted to provide <laughs> a little bit of Utah oh. for you to, to uh, enjoy. Oh, wow. So That's beautiful. Thank you so much. These are bookends. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> So, and then, yeah. Very beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. These are beautiful. And I think we wow. also have a few other little Utah gifts in there, too. So kind of you. We can have them sent to you because I know they're a little heavy. <laughs> they are a little heavy, but I think I could carry them. <laughs> These are just gorgeous. Well, they will have a place of honor, and just, uh, just being here is. Thank you. Thanks enough. Thank you. Thank you. So are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. That's a great idea. And at some point, that parent uh, dysfunction and the whole family dysfunction, um, how do you address that? Yeah, the question about, you know, there's often parent dysfunction, probably because of these really difficult diagnoses. I think the only thing we can do is really recommend that they get, the parents get professional help as quickly as possible. And one thing I found is we have a palliative care team, and I always thought of that as like hospice, but they don't. They take care of chronic care patients too, and they will often meet with the family and they will suggest, you know, programs or therapy for the parents. Because I think all we can do is say, it's really, I mean, I tell them, this is really stressful. It, it will strain your marriage. It will strain many relationships. So try to get some help early, you know, and I think if we're not afraid to say it, then it makes them less afraid, because I've seen the same thing. Yeah. One of the other things I find is that they don't want the kids to play with the computers. They want them to stay up all these screen times. And then in, in reality, I tell them, get a computer, get them whatever they need, and make that happen. I totally agree. So the question about screen time, because computers are going to be their lifeline to the world. But you can get a little um, film that goes over the computer that blocks blue light. I think really blue light, if we could reduce that, would be good. But I agree with you. We shouldn't, we shouldn't stop them from using computers. We don't have any evidence that that's going to make them worse faster. And it definitely is going to be a lifeline. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Seving. Arlene, that was a beautiful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a comment on the uh, administration of uh, a person's bone marrow derived stem cells. Yes, please. Uh, yes, that is a travesty. Uh, just uh, a little bit of background on that. Uh, the FDA asserted that it had authority to control that. Uh, and uh, the way the law was written, uh, it was ambiguous whether, in this case, uh, the patient is having bone marrow cells, their own bone marrow cells extracted, 
uh, they're screened or not screened, and then they're injected into the vitreous cavity. Uh, and, uh, and, well, sometimes havoc ensues. Uh, and the uh, FDA asserted that it had regulatory authorities over that. The company, of course, strongly denied that uh, and persisted in it. Uh, but last week, there was a, a federal court ruling saying that the FDA does, in fact, have uh, oversight of that process. That if, is if I great could just news. make uh, one yes. her, one heretical uh, statement, <laughs> however, please. Uh, on the flip side, it is interesting to consider that there are probably 400 cases of uh, these cells being administered, uh, and uh, there are only a handful of uh, cases of misadventure. Uh, and uh, one can perhaps begin to think uh, that, in fact, under the right conditions, this could be a safe uh, procedure. Uh, obviously, it would need some uh, better uh, rigorous testing, and whether it has the magical uh, effects that people are looking for is a different question. Thank you so much for those comments. I think that's exactly right. I mean, just because it's not being done in a controlled manner and there are untoward effects doesn't mean there's nothing at all there. So I think you're right. If it were studied appropriately, there might be something there. Thank you. Arlene, I had a question for you. Yes. Um, among the cases that um, you had the pie chart for, uh, which showed the majority having some sort of a retinal diagnosis, do you think that that's influenced by being a tertiary referral center? Or do you think that uh, when we look at nystagmus as a whole, that, that really about 50% are attributable to some sort of a genetic retinal uh, cause? So that's a really good question, and of course I don't know exactly, but those patients were from our general peds clinics as well as genetics clinics. However, we're still at a university, so it's not like a private practice clinic. So I think it probably is a bit skewed, but let's see, Brittany Scruggs is here who just looked at the data for the textbook. What was the percent that were retina? Was it 70% roughly? Yeah, so about 70% were retina. So I think it, it's at least 50-50. Let's put it that way. Yes. Yeah, I, I wonder if there is uh, legal issues uh, concerning about gene tests because in, we do have some cases that when the gene test tells the mutation is from the mother and it got blamed and it even divorced. So in other words, um, like prejudice toward the mother if it's an X-linked thing, or do you mean the mother is a carrier and the father isn't, so it's non-paternity? I see, so blame. So, so these are issues that are really sensitive issues in genetics. So I always, when I have an X-linked disorder, and I'm telling the parents, okay, this boy has X-linked retinoschisis, it's X-linked, it's on mom's X chromosome, but what I say is, it's really a combination of both parents because dad passed on the Y chromosome, okay? If dad had passed on an X chromosome, that bad X would have not caused any problem. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit, you know, gamesmanship, but it at least puts in their mind, it's not, you know, somebody's fault. And I always also say, none of us would pass on a bad genetic trait if we had a choice in it. It's not a choice. And I also look at the child and say, and plus, he's got your beautiful curly hair. He's got all these good things from you. So I, I do that multi-pronged thing. It's, it's nobody's fault. It's really a combination. And, uh, you know, he got some good things from you too. But it's very difficult. And people struggle with that. And again, having some kind of a social worker, palliative care uh, person who can refer the parents for further counseling if needed, I think is really good. Yes. Um, thank you for that lovely talk, and I want to especially thank you for talking about how to deliver bad news. That's something we don't discuss enough in ophthalmology, and we do have to do that yeah. from time to time. And um, the other thing, unrelated a question, is regarding albinism testing. If it's difficult to get testing because of financial limitations or logistical limitations, should we just focus on just getting a Hermansky padlock test? Well, it's hard to just get a hermansky pudlak test and because a lot of times in albinism, even with hermansky pudlak you only get one 
like a lot of people only have one mutation found. So the problem is if you get just a Hermansky Pudlak test and they have just one mutation in the Hermansky Pudlak or in a Hermansky Pudlak syndrome gene, you might be tempted to say, oh, well, they must have it. But yet they may have two mutations in tyrosinase that explains their albinism. So it's much more accurate to get the whole panel. It might be less expensive to get the platelet EM, depending on their insurance. And they do the platelet EM at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and so you can do that. I mean, I've had a couple of kids where insurance was kind of balking and they were going to have surgery. Like a, a lot of albinism kids have, this, I mean, have strabismus, right? They go for surgery. And so you can get a platelet clotting test pretty easily and pretty quickly and pretty cheaply. And most kids with albinism look like they bruise a lot because they don't have much pigment. And so they, parents can see the bruises. So it's pretty easy to document. They've seen a lot of bruises. They're going to have surgery. And I would get the platelet clotting test or, you know, aggregation test before I would get just a hermansky pudlak syndrome gene. For genetic panels, um, is there a nystagmus panel? Because based on your talk, I think it's so useful. And I also think Carver Lab would be the one that can develop it, but I don't Great see it. Great minds think alike, right. and I have suggested that. However, my suggestion has been rejected. <laughs> So there may be someone has a pull with some other lab uh, because I think it would be very helpful, yeah. very helpful to just get all the most common genes and put them in there. I'm going to wrap up this session. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Drack and all of our speakers in the session and the audience for their questions. Thank you for making it this a great first session.